Ladies and gentlemen, uh, good morning or good afternoon, uh, wherever you happen to be. My name is David Donoghue. On behalf of the Institute of International and European Affairs, I'd like to welcome you to today's talk by the European Commissioner for International Partnerships, Jutta Opilainen. The Commissioner's talk uh, is the third webinar in the Development Matters series uh, uh, hosted by the Institute and supported by Irish Aid the Irish government's development cooperation program. We're delighted to have Commissioner Opelainen with us today. She'll speak for about 10 minutes, first of all, uh, on the subject of harnessing inclusive multilateralism for international development. And she will then have a few minutes in which she can take questions from the audience. We're delighted to be joined also by the Director General of Irish Aid, Rory de Burka, who will uh, deliver some remarks following the Commissioner's address. And the Commissioner's Deputy Chef, Chef de Cabinet, Sandra Bartelt, has also kindly agreed to answer questions when the Commissioner needs to, to leave us. Uh, I, I, Rory de Burka will also be available. Some housekeeping points. The uh, Commissioner's presentation and the subsequent Q&A are all on the record. You're free to pose questions uh, using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screens uh, whenever they occur to you during the event and we'll do our best to get to them. Uh, we welcome also those who are participating via YouTube. Uh, and you're invited also to join the discussion on Twitter using the handle at IIEA and the hashtag uh, hash IIEA30. I should mention that the Institute is currently celebrating its 30th anniversary. Let me turn now to Commissioner Opelainen. Uh, her role involves, as you know, providing managerial uh, oversight and strategic direction for the European Union's vast programme of uh, activity in support of international cooperation and sustainable development. And Mr. Benainen served as a member of the Finnish Parliament from 2013 to 19. She was the first woman to lead Finland's Social Democratic Party. From 2011 to 2014, she served as Finland's Deputy Prime Minister and Finance Minister, and we are honoured and delighted, Commissioner, that you're, that you're with us today. You have the floor. Thank you very much. And first of, uh, first of all, thank you for the invitation to speak at today's webinar. And congratulations uh, for the Institute's anniversary, 30th anniversary. Uh, the topic of, of today's discussion is, is actually very timely. Today's reality sees a post-war multilateral system under pressure. Unilateralism is on the rise. And after the fall's end of history, we are back to more competitive international environment. We are back to power politics, but also competition between societal models. At the same time, actually, we face a growing number of global challenges that cannot be addressed by any country alone. Climate, environmental and biodiversity crisis, widening inequality, under-regulated migration, erosion of democracy, and now a global pandemic which has caused huge societal and economic damage. Concerted international action is no longer an option, but a necessity. Yet this is more difficult to secure than unilateralism. Against this background, the EU must revise multilateralism, and not only in multilateral organizations themselves. We need to pursue our ambitions throughout our international partnerships. So, dear friends, what does this mean? Firstly, the multilateral system and the EU's place in it. Europe 
believes multilateralism to be the most effective means to regulate international relations, protect the most vulnerable, and promote open societies that leave no one behind. So in other words, to build a sustainable future from which all can benefit. It's in our DNA. The EU and UN were set up at the same time. Our values are the same. Yet there is no place for complacency. The ultimate objective is impact. We want to work with multilateral organizations, but do so in a way that is effective and delivers results. In February, as you know, we published a joint communication on strengthening the EU's contribution to rules-based multilateralism. And this communication really sets our, out our vision for re-energizing and reforming multilateralism. The multilateral system needs to be more fit for purpose. This means making international organizations more accountable, more transparent, and more results oriented. It also means developing governance in emerging areas not yet subject to global governance, particularly those where national boundaries mean nothing. For instance, how do we secure the right balance of rights and responsibilities for major multinationals, including major technology companies. It also means building inclusive multilateralism to ensure the full range of partners, private, public, regions, governments, civil society, participate in multilateral decision making. Partnership is one of the five pillars of the 2030 agenda. It is an abler for the other piece, which are people, planet, prosperity and peace. So the EU will work in an open and accessible way with partners while being more strategic and targeted at the same time. This also includes partnerships with like-minded partners and regional organizations, as well as civil society. We will work with them at the multilateral level to advance our strategic priorities, which are Green Deal, digitalization, sustainable growth and jobs, migration, and peace, security, and human development. The COVID crisis has shown the value of multilateral action to address shared challenges. So working with multilateral partners, there is an opportunity for real, real impact, an opportunity to shape global responses to 21st century challenges. So dear friends, this brings me to my second point. Being more strategic and uh, targeted also implies speaking and delivering as a strong and visible European Union in a well-coordinated approach with its member states. Europe faces mounting competition from an increasing number of emerging uh, or re-emerging powers. And in this more contested world, we can no longer afford to luxury 
of fragmentation and duplication. In early spring 2020, so one year ago, all major European development actors decided to come together to help partner countries deal with the shock of the pandemic. And this new way of working in a Team Europe approach combines resources, expertise and networks of the EU, but also from the member states, their implementing agencies and European development finance institutions. So this innovation arose in a grave moment of crisis where scale, coordination and focus were necessary for maximum impact. And I, I'm very delighted to tell you that we are now using the current EU programming of our funds for the period up to 2027 to develop Team Europe initiatives. So we also do, are doing this programming exercise in a Team Europe way. These Team Europe initiatives, they will focus on coordinated actions to bring strategic transformation in areas related to key EU priorities. The Green Deal, human development, digital, growth and jobs, good governance and migration. So, ladies and gentlemen, securing a multilateral system that is fit for tackling the challenges we face is far from easy. But the crisis has brought home the absolute need for us to work together and not selfishly. And the Team Europe approach with its wealth of skills, experience and partnerships offers real hope for positive change. So let me end by telling you that the EU will be counting on you, counting on you to facilitate our action at the multilateral level and to help us spearhead a true global global sustainable and inclusive recovery that leaves no one behind together let's deliver as one team europe so greetings from brussels and looking forward to our conversation David, I don't hear you now. Um, th th I was thanking you, Commissioner, for that terrific tour de force on the challenges facing the EU. And uh, I'd now like to ask uh, Roy de Berka to pick up the gauntlet, as it were, to take up the challenge that the Commissioner has put out. What, what are we doing, Roy, from the Irish perspective to respond to this challenge? Yeah, thanks, David. And Kethos, Commissioner, um, thank you. Um, really useful and I think interesting um, remarks there. And what are we doing? Well, I think in the first instance, um, I mean, we are, we've moved to be net contributors. So the amount of money that Ireland is putting into the, 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 the shared pot uh, has gone up. Um, it's more than doubled in quantum over the last decade. And it's gone from about 16% of our ODA in 2013 to 25% of our ODA today. And I think that means we have to play a better game. You know, we have to ask better questions and we have to become a much more active member of Team Europe, um, which has been a fantastic innovation and one which we've embraced. And I think from a smaller member state perspective, Team Europe allows us the possibility of contributing to a greater whole, but also maybe being catalytic, uh, I would hope, in trying to encourage uh, the member states and uh, to work in a in a in a in a more uh, communitarian way uh, in country with 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 the institutions um, and I think we need to do better um, and, and I think we're at the beginning 
uh, of a journey where, where we try and maximize the highest common factor of our collective uh, actions. Uh, and I really would be interested in hearing from you, Commissioner, how, how you would see us, uh, a member state of Ireland's size, try to do better in, in terms of, of Team Europe uh, and, and that partnership approach that you mentioned that is at the heart of the 2030 agenda that David uh, with, with Kenya helped us achieve. And, um, you know, the symbolism of, of the renaming of, of, of your, uh, uh, you know, uh, of your, your role to, to, to Commissioner for International Partnership is really important. And I think we have to work with you to, to put life into that, to breathe into it uh, and, and, and to help you take it forward. Um, and I think really interested to hear how you how you see that, you know, we can use our voice uh, in New York, in Geneva, elsewhere, married with our actions on the ground to, to try and maximize, um, you know, that sense of, of, of working together to making that rules based system uh, be as effective as we want uh, as a member state. Uh, that's at the heart of our uh, development cooperation policy, but it's at the heart of our foreign policy more generally. Uh, there's an Irish phrase, you know, we live in the shadow of others. Uh, and I think that's, that's, that, that's that the multilateral system is the umbrella that smaller countries uh, take shelter under. And I think that's the truth, not just for us within Europe, but more broadly. So really interested to hear your comments as to how we could, you know, help you help us uh, on this journey. Thank you. Thanks, Rory. Commissioner, would you like to come back in on, on some of those points Rory raised? Yes, thank you very much. And um, yeah, I, I have a couple of points I would like to make uh, uh, also relating to your comments. And um, uh, the first one is that um, I think it's, uh, we have, uh, as I told you, we do this programming exercise now a bit differently because uh, we have really at the country level to be able to define these Team Europe initiatives through our EU delegation, together, together with the member states, but also with the uh, financial uh, institutions like uh, European Investment Bank. And we have defined approximately 150 Team Europe initiatives around the world. And what Ireland could do is definitely to be part of these initiatives. So I really hope that you could contribute and participate uh, in these different initiatives, uh, especially in Africa, but also uh, elsewhere. And I think there are several policy areas where you have experience and, and also competence to, to provide us and, and, and to be part of this, uh, this uh, joint uh, journey and joint approach at the country level. So uh, I can't remember now uh, by heart that you know uh, how many to how many initiatives you are already planning to participate. But I think there are you know always room for uh, for uh, improvement. Improvement. So of course you know uh, this is uh, the one message I wanted to pass. The second uh, relating to uh, multilateral organization. You know that what we could do more in order to work as a team Europe <laughs> in uh, uh, different international organizations. I think this is a very, very important question. And uh, I want to give you one example. For instance, uh, education. Uh, under the previous MF MFF, we funded uh, around 7% uh, of our external, uh, external uh, funding or financing uh, to education. So 7% went to education. Now, because of the COVID-19, I wanted to increase funding to education to be at least 10%. If we look at the global architecture, eight architecture of, of education, there are several players. Uh, we know that the um, many European Union member states are also, you know, uh, providing uh, financial uh, support uh, and aid to those organizations, like also to to, uh, to partner countries. So that 50, actually 50 percent of of uh, uh, ODA to education comes from the European Union member states or the Commission. So we are the biggest uh, donor. 
but how well are we coordinated? Do we really, you know, have this kind of a strategic uh, vision that how are, how are we able to provide access to quality education to the uh, children and, and uh, adolescents of, of the world in Africa or elsewhere? No, we don't have that. And that's why we need more coordination. And I think the coordination is needed also in order to strengthen the visibility of the EU action, because it's like you said, that really, you know, even though we are the biggest donor in, in many policy areas, people don't know about it. And uh, also from that perspective, I think in order to achieve results, but also to strengthen the visibility, we need to be well coordinated. And that's what I try to do now, uh, of course, at the UN level, so uh, in, in the UN family. But also, I would say that the role of the IFIs is very, very crucial. So how do we work within the World Bank as a team? How do we work within the IMF as a team? So I would say that uh, this need for <laughs> improvement uh, 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 in the name of coordination is not only uh, uh, in the UN family, it's, it's more broadly everywhere where we really are, you know, uh, participating in, in the uh, international organization. So, um, but this is, um, this is the priority and, and step by step, we try to also make progress. Richard, thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to bring in a couple of questions now from the audience. So uh, if I may begin with, with one of my own, uh, I'm delighted that you are putting uh, delivery of the SDGs at the center of your, your efforts. Um, and uh, I wish you every success in that regard, especially uh, as we move further into the decade of action. Um, but in the joint commun communication in February, you recognized that COVID-19 is having a uh, a, a negative or a regressive effect on delivering the SDGs. Uh, I mean, what do you think the EU can do to try to ensure that we build back better uh, on the basis of the SDGs, that we use the SDGs as a positive agenda to get beyond the COVID or to respond to the COVID-19 challenges? Thank you, and, and, and this, is, uh, this topic is actually very close to my heart, because um, being a, a commissioner for, for international partnerships, I really see that um, SDGs and Agenda 2030 is, is a kind of framework for, for our uh, activities and, and um, cooperation. And Definitely, uh, COVID-19 has had a negative impact, we know that. And that's why actually we proposed, so as a commission, we proposed the Global Recovery Initiative last year, where the idea was to combine uh, debt relief, debt restructuring, but also investments, both private and public investments to SDGs. Because, of course, um, uh, as a politician, I always need to be honest and I want to do that and I want to be. Uh, we are not able to ach achieve sustainable development goals by the year 2030 without a very strong engagement with the private sector. Mm. We know that the challenges are so huge uh, and, you know, they are now even bigger than they were uh, before the COVID-19. So the only way to really achieve those goals is, firstly, we need a very strong commitment from the governments to increase their public finances uh, to our partner countries, and also uh, their commitment to support debt restructuring, in, especially in Africa, because you know their fiscal space is so limited that they are really not able to operate uh, without debt restructuring. And the second commitment we need is from the private sector, so that really they are part of this approach. And, uh, and that's why uh, what the European Union can do is really to push forward this global recovery initiative we launched last year, so that uh, you know, the whole international community um, 
buys in in a way and also uh, commits uh, to this uh, initiative. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, a question from uh, Porig Carmody, who is with Trinity College in, in, in Dublin. Porig refers, I think, to, uh, to other countries outside the EU and asks whether the commitment that we do see within the EU to inclusive multilateralism, whether other countries outside the EU uh, are, are similarly motivated. Is it your sense that the EU is acting to some extent on its own in trying to rebuild multilateralism? That's a very good question. And I, I think, um, of course, uh, during the past year, we have been really in the middle of pandemic and crisis. And, and you know, the focus has been, uh, you know, on the exit strategy, how to get out of the crisis. Now we can see that uh, more and more in Europe, but also in the US and elsewhere, uh, the focus is on recovery. But we have to remember that still, you know, uh, in the great majority of the countries of the world, the focus is on the exit strategy. So they are still really struggling, struggling uh, with the crisis. And, and that's why we, of course, need to help them, for, for instance, with vaccines and so forth. But my my uh, impression is that whenever we are at the stage of recovery and, and really we can also think of the lessons learned in a way that you know what we learned from the crisis we are uh, able to discuss a bit more deeply or more in a detail on multilateralism that you know what do we and how do we want to revise the multilateral uh, organ uh, cooperation and, and the multilateral system and we wanted to put to the table this idea of inclusive multilateralism mm. because we see that it's not enough anymore to operate only with, you know, intergovernmentally, that, you know, the governments are negotiating and, and then we make agreements and then we either implement those agreements or not. But we also need to, because these, you know, the, the challenges we are facing, for instance, the climate change, it's not enough, you know, to operate through the governments. We need them, of course, but we also need to engage with the private sector, as I explained in my previous answers, but also with the civil society. So the idea of multi, uh, this inclusive multilateralism is also to build up a different networks like we actually did in the COVID-19 crisis, because first we operated, you know, mainly uh, between the governments, but then we started to operate also with Gavi and WHO and, you know, with other uh, stakeholders of, 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 the, of the international community. So this is the idea of the inclusive multilateralism. And personally, I'm very optimistic that we are able to get support also outside the EU and especially now uh, looking at the uh, US and, and the new administration in the US. I, I really hope that this could be one of the topics to, to cooperate and, and may, uh, work together with them. Great. Thank you, Commissioner. There, were, there are many, many questions. I know your time is limited, but let me try and get to, to some of them. Um, uh, Donald Cronin, uh, who is with Irish Aid, uh, asked, to what extent are the SDGs being followed through by the other European commissioners, by your colleagues in the college? And what are the challenges of ensuring coherence uh, across the EU's action in support of the SDGs? Yes, actually, this is, um, of course, I'm a new commissioner, so <laughs> I don't know uh, what was the tradition in the previous co uh, colleges or, or commissions, but um, I can tell you that we really try to work in a holistic and comprehensive way within the commission. So, of course, uh, we know that now, uh, you know, for instance, SDGs are part of this semester, European semester procedure. And uh, Paolo Gentiloni, as a commissioner for economics, is, is responsible for that. Uh, but, you know, also with, uh, with uh, other DGs and commissioners, uh, we try to work as a team. Uh, and uh, of course, this programming exercise I was preferring to also earlier, this gives us, gives our, us an opportunity also uh, to, to look in a holistic way, 
you know, the Green Deal, digitalization, human development, all those policy priorities, which are in a way part of the uh, sustainable development goals, but also they are priorities for the current commission. And we do this uh, programming exercise together with the different DGs within the commission. So even though I'm the, you know, the, the commissioner who is uh, respons uh, responsible for NDG Global Europe, this new financial uh, uh, instrument for my portfolio countries. We do this programming exercise together with my colleague and other DGs also within the Commission. And that's also the way to take, uh, taking into account, of course, their expertise and really have this kind of a holistic and comprehensive uh, approach uh, also relating to SDGs. But David, thanks for this opportunity. It was great to be uh, for a while in Ireland <laughs> and uh, have a very nice uh, spring and, and, and summer, actually, uh, and uh, looking forward uh, to outcome of this uh, great conversation. And, and my dear Deputy Head of Cabinet, Sandra, is, is then replacing me. Thank you very much, Commissioner. We really valued you giving us your time uh, uh, this morning. It's terrific to meet you this way. We hope you can come physically to Ireland at some stage. And in the meantime, we wish you every success. And I know that Irish Aid will be uh, working very, very closely with you and your team. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Okay. Um, so, Sandra, can I welcome you uh, to continue the conversation uh, uh, on behalf of the Commissioner? Um, let me ask uh, another couple of questions which have been coming in. Um, do, do, Sandra, do you think that uh, st stronger cooperation on global health will be part of, um, uh, will be achievable? Uh, um, over the coming period in response to the pandemic? Is, is it something where you think Team Europe will be able to uh, make, a, make a contribution? Yes, uh, thank you very much. And um, also good afternoon, afternoon from my side to Ireland. So uh, definitely global health will be um, a policy area in which more multilateral and which we will see more multilateral cooperation and um, also more team Europe approaches. So we have already seen how it has started. It has started um, with the COVAX initiative that um, Commissioner Opilain also mentioned. And um, now we are also working very closely together with member states to see also how we can roll out and distribute um, vaccines to our partner countries. Um, and this can be done uh, preferably through COVAX or other bilateral sharing mechanisms. So um, there are a lot of um, practical examples here. So COVAX is maybe the, the most known, but then we are also now looking very much um, to Africa and the African uh, Center for Disease and Control um, that is also a bit under the auspices of the African Union and um, or the Pasteur Institute in uh, Senegal, where um, it is multilateralism, but with um, regional partners or regional organizations. And we are also trying to do this, of course, with our member states in a Team Europe approach, where it is always possible. On the other hand, um, you can see that, uh, for instance, now in Geneva, they are negotiating um, or they are looking at the possibilities to negotiate this um, new international pandemic treaty. And this is, of course, uh, um, an, another dimension in a way, because this then really goes into an international agreement, uh, legally binding. And um, here, I, I think, um, the cautiousness is maybe a bit bigger than when it comes to um, just coordinated cooperation that can deliver concrete results in terms of um, policy financing and um, cooperation activities. So we need to see. But here, of course, also, if it was... Um, to come the, um, the international pandemic treaty. This would also be something where um, 
the Commission would be mandated by the member states to negotiate and um, to be representing the Union and um, to coordinate with the member states in this, of course. Thank you very much, Sandra. Just still on, on Team Europe, uh, a question from uh, Ashfaq Kouresi, who asks whether South Asian countries will feature on the agenda for Team Europe. Yes, definitely. What we are looking at in the programming exercise, so we are trying um, to have um, maximum two, two uh, Team Europe initiatives per partner country, not more, because we want to ensure that the Team Europe initiatives, that they are consistent and co coherent with our programming priorities. And uh, normally we only have three priority sectors that is um, coordinated and based on uh, the partner country's um, poverty strategy. And so we do not, I mean, we do not want to lose focus here. And we want the Team Europe initiatives also to fit into these priorities. And this is why we are saying maximum two Team Europe initiatives per country. But so far, um, what we have seen, I mean, now it is still work in progress, but what we have seen is that we have a really, um, one or two Team Europe initiatives in relation to each country. Thanks, Andrea. Coming back to the issue of uh, more effective multilateralism, what can the EU do to strengthen um, or to improve its own representation in the IFIs and, and to, to, be, to speak with one voice there, given the various challenges posed by the treaties um, and the status of the EU there? Yes, this is also an area that is addressed in the um, multilateralism communication. And um, you might have, there are also currently council conclusions actually in preparation for, in preparation of the UNGA this year, um, that is also dealing with uh, multilateralism. And here, um, first of all, it is um, the coordination through the boards so with the European um, board members in um, W, um, uh, uh, in the World Bank and in the IMF. So, and we are already having this uh, kind of, we are um, inviting them once a year to Brussels. And um, now last year was virtually, but, and then um, we are trying to coordinate and we try to talk about our priorities and objectives in uh, working with the IFIs. That's one thing, but uh, the other thing is then, of course, um, to speak with one voice and to be also able to represent the EU and its member states uh, at the multilateral level. And here, you know, of course, that in at the UN, uh, for instance, here, um, sometimes we were not able to speak because um, we require this common accord or unanimity, which is, nowhere really stated in the treaties for these kind of uh, statements, but it is a practice. And here from the commission side, we are told we are actively promoting the qualified majority approach so that we are not really weakening our representation in international bodies and that we are able to speak on behalf of the EU and its member states with one voice. So uh, to also be a truly geopolitical actor there. Yes, yeah. Um, there are various questions on Team Europe, Sandra. Uh, one of them asks really whether the Team Europe approach can lead to better outcomes on migration, uh, given the lack of solidarity uh, in relation to EU migration policy among member states. Um, yes, uh, so this is, um, this is, of course, a very important um, policy area that we will have to address. So under the new funding instrument that the commissioner also mentioned, um, Andeki Global Europe, we have a spending target of 10% uh, for migration. And um, here, I think also that the expectations from member states are going to be very high because um, so far under the last MFF, we always had the European uh, Union trust funds on, um, for instance, the emergency trust fund in Africa. And um, the, they foresee possibilities where member states are very closely uh, involved 
in the different projects uh, through the operational boards of, um, of these trust funds. But um, they will now be discontinued because now we have the new MFF, we have sufficient funding and um, we should be able to, uh, to roll this out. Whatever, however, we have committed to also address migration at the regional level to be able to um, top up, for instance, national programs when it is necessary. And here we have also seen already a couple of interesting uh, Team Europe initiatives on migration, for instance, uh, Spain for, um, for Western Africa, they are thinking about a regional um, Team Europe initiative there um, that we are looking in um, with them. Great. Um, let me turn, Sandra, to uh, EU-Africa uh, relations. I mean, how, how can we use the, uh, the closer cooperation between the EU and the AU to strengthen multilateralism within Africa or on the issues uh, facing uh, Af African states? This is, I should say, something of great importance to Ireland. And when you have spoken, I might just ask Roy de Berger to come in uh, on that from the Irish perspective. But if you, how do you see the EU-AU dialogue as a way of uh, uh, achieving more effective multilateralism? Yes, this will also be a definitely an important actor, in particular now in the run-up to the AU-EU summit um, that we are likely or that we're going to have probably under the French presidency then. And um, here we already see emerging uh, um, events and uh, high level conferences um, like you know the the finance uh, financing for Africa uh, on the 18th of May in Paris and um, so here we really see um, that the cooperation is accelerating and the African Union will be a very important actor in, in this absolutely so um, and how this is going to be done in concrete, I guess that um, when we're coming a bit closer to it, that there will be also a roadmap to, towards the summit, that we have such a roadmap, that we, we will be presented with uh, such a roadmap, um, and where then uh, the different um, mem member states, uh, commission, will have their respective roles therein. But if I may also mention, that um, also my commissioner, she has been the chief negotiator for the commission for the new um, post Cotonou agreement yeah. with yeah. the with the uh, organization of the African, Caribbean and Pacific states. And here we managed to close the negotiations. Um, we initiated the agreement. And as compared to the previous agreement, there is also um, language on international cooperation and that we really also want to mobilize this group of state in order to foster international cooperation and uh, to coordinate our positions in view of forthcoming big international conferences so as, such as the COPS conferences this year. And indeed I suppose the Food Security Summit that will be another one uh, coming up in September. Yep. Rory uh, could I ask you to intervene on any of those points? Yeah, um, and thanks, David. I mean, and, and thanks, Sandra. I mean, I think specifically on 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 the EU AU summit. I mean, I think I think this is a this is a really important structure that we have to engage with, uh, and I think it, it's the it's one of those classic foreign policy dilemmas where where I think we can all see the importance of an EU AU dialogue that's really rich and functional. But I also think that to try and bridge two different structures uh, and I think sometimes th there's a challenge to us you know uh, in we're not the same the EU structure is much more integrated um, uh, than, than the AU structures and I think sometimes we we miss the politics in it uh, and I think that's a challenge to us as we move forward because the real issues that are on our shared agenda Europe and Africa you know ultimately have a lot of, of politics uh, in them, whether it's migration, whether it's climate, whether it's food, um, whether it's development. But we know that we have to have, you know, the defining relationship for Europe 
in this century will probably be with Africa as it becomes, you know, the biggest continent in the world by population uh, over the next 40, 50 years. So it's really strategic. And I think that brings us back to the Team Europe point, you know, and Team Europe, I mean, I, I think there's the projects that the commissioner mentioned that, you know, we, we're currently planning on, on, on a deep engagement in about 20. But I think it's also about a state of mind. I think it's more than just 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 coming together to work on projects. I think it is about how we how we work politically in, in a very engaged way as member states, as 27 plus plus the institutions, or in smaller groups, and then feed it back up. Um, and there are going to be real challenges to us in that because the the tensions between between member states will play out. For example, in the discussion on on you know coordination in the IFIs, you know that that what's good for us collectively, brokering that as we all navigate our national positions is 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 going to be a challenge. And I think this is where you know it's really good to see the Commission take leadership and pushing a Team Europe approach. I do think we're at the beginning, and I think in, in that effective multilateralism that we've been talking about today, and that sense of 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 a world that's becoming more challenging. You know the tectonic plates of global power are shifting. We are going to have to come up with new and smarter ways of working together. That's intensely political, intensely practical, um, and much better coordinated over the decade to 2030. Uh, and I do think you know we're at the beginning of that at the moment. Uh, and I think there's a journey to go, but but it's a good beginning, and I think we can take take a lot of hope from that. So. Th that's just a reflection uh, that I have um, uh, from from the from the conversation so far. With that, David, back to you. Thank you, Murray. Um, another question here, Sandra. Uh, it relates to the the challenge of getting uh, bigger financial flows for the least developed countries and fragile states. Currently, only about six percent of development finance, which is mobilised, goes to the LDCs. What can we do, uh, for example, in building on the uh, NDICI regulation in the MFF, what can we do to increase the flows available for LDCs? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, uh, so here, um, I mean, I don't have now the full figure, but it is also um, in the objective of the NDICI that um, they should be treated um, with a priority. So um, that those um, should be looked at financially with uh, priority. And if you see the financial allocations in, in, the, um, in the ICI, this somehow also matches with these objectives because um, we have most of the LDCs in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, and this is where most of our funding is going. So here we have um, 29 mil, uh, billion. And um, here we have most of the LDC, so already by definition, we, we have this amount of funding that needs to be uh, dispatched among the um, sub-Saharan African countries. Um, thank you very much, Sandra. Um, I mean, coming back just to the general issue of inclusive multilateralism, uh, you know, clearly there are forces within the EU who uh, are which sort of movement, act in a different direction. Uh, you know, there, there, there is nationalism, there is populism uh, in, in some member states. How confident are you that we can keep a consensus going within the EU in favor of, of multilateral approaches? I mean, how can we keep uh, the entire uh, number of member states on our side in relation to that? Well, uh, I think that um, for the European Union as um, also being an international organization and so by definition being in a way part of the multilateral system, as the Commissioner said, it's part of our DNA, it's part of the values uh, on which the Union is founded are the same values and the values of the United Nations, for instance. So, and, and this is something very important to have better participatory approaches and um, the rule of law, democracy, human rights as the underlying principles of this uh, reinvigorated multilateral system. Because um, I think what we have seen in the past is also that um, 
um, big players are using the multilateral system in a way pretending they are being multilateralist but pushing their own national interests and we want to move away from that and reinvigorate it also on the basis of the values that they are sharing so this is a very important point for us and i think here uh, a key point will also be how to work together with like-minded partners and um, as the commissioner said now we are also having high hopes on on the us and uh, coming back and being to, uh, willing to engage into the multilateral system again. We will have the um, EU-US summit on the 15th of June. And I think also there um, that democracy and uh, multilateralism, what we can do together, uh, will be high on the agenda. Yeah, I think that uh, the, the return of uh, uh, a U.S. administration which is committed to multilateralism is, is obviously very encouraging. Dare I say it, uh, a good friend of ours, um, Samantha Power, is now the head of USAID, um, so we attach particular uh, hopes to Samantha's arrival. You, you mentioned the UN, um, Sandra. Uh, you're absolutely right. The U EU and the UN are grounded in similar values. Are there sort of synergies that can be pursued between the the EU and the UN at country level, if, for example, in, in, in relation to delivering the SDGs, are there ways in which the EU and the UN can work more closely together uh, at, the, at the country level? Yes, this is actually what we are also trying to do now with this uh, programming period, because now for a couple of years, um, the uh, UN, they have undertaken this very comprehensive UN development system reform. And an important uh, point of this reform is the uh, UN resident coordinators that are um, in country. And so for us, it's also important to work together with them uh, in country in order to really be aligned on uh, the achievement of, of the uh, SDGs. And um, there, we are also working um, in using um, uh, the same frameworks in a way to see a bit um, what each donor is doing and how we can be complementing each other. So this is uh, for us um, an important element and uh, even more so since with the NDICI um, we are following this principle of uh, geographization. So we have most of the funds that have been shifted to actually the um, the geo um, the national levels and the uh, regional level, so that um, the cooperation with the UN for us will be very important at the country level. Thank you very much, Sandra. Uh, we're coming to, towards the end um, of, of this conversation. There, there, I mean, there are many issues that one one could take up. For example, the the whole area of climate multilateralism, uh, of what the EU can do to ensure a really uh, strong impact uh, at COPs, but the, the commissioner has touched on that, on that a little bit. Um, the role of the private sector, the, the commissioner didn't really have much time to, to go into that. I mean, if one is talking about inclusive multilateralism, the private sector's contribution, for example, to achievement of the SDGs is clearly vital. Are there particular initiatives which the EU can take or is already taking to, to mobilize the international private sector in support of, of international development? Well, um, so for us, the private sector is um, in the first place, or I mean, now I'm distinguishing between private sector and civil society organizations. Yes, of course. I mean, just private uh, business, <laughs> private sector, so, yes, yes. But because of, we're also doing a lot with civil society organizations, and to have more, to create more space for civil society, you know, uh, shrinking space. And um, here we are also thinking about having uh, partnerships um, through our funding with uh, civil society organizations. Now with private sector, private sector, I would see the private sector first and foremost in the context of our EFSD plus, the financial arm of the NDICI. And um, because here they can be among the uh, eligible counterparts. And of course, um, when we are, for instance, um, concluding the contracts with the big um, IFIs or European financial institutions, then this is cascading down 
and the private sector is a very important element in there. And for us, what is important is um, to foster and mobilize investment also by um, mobilizing the private sector here. So, and um, this will be an important point. I don't know whether um, you have heard the announcement of our president at the Global Health Summit that we are looking now also into this uh, Team Europe initiative concerning manufacturing in Africa. This would of course also be an example um, where we will need the private sector and where we'll also need to create the investment climate for um, the private sector to uh, invest like pharma, pharma industry. And um, here um, it will be important also, you know, to think about the uh, transfer of uh, technology and now how uh, training, technical assistance measures and all, all these kind of things to really make a careful analysis on how we can best roll that out. So um, this would be um, definitely now also in view of the, of the global health um, uh, crisis and what we were saying that this is also a, a, a core area of engagement um, multilaterally that this would be of course a flagship initiative for uh, as a, a team group initiative no that sounds very interesting uh, mm -hmm. a very worthwhile direction to go in sandra thank you very much for being so generous uh, both in your time and and in the replies you've given to the very diverse questions. We were really, really grateful. I found it fascinating. Uh, I'd, I'd now like to ask Rory de Berka to just to say some uh, final words, really reflecting on both what the commissioner told us and the, the Q&A session. Rory, over to you. Thanks, David. Thanks, thanks, Sandra. I mean, it's not much to say, I think, because it's been said. Um, I, look, I think this is a really important discussion and it's really important to have have both Sandra and the commissioner here, partly because you know the as I said earlier on the the, the commission uh, you know spends more of Ireland's ODA than any other actor in the world. But I think much more importantly than that, um, because the EU acting as the EU and the EU plus the twenty seven is the biggest development actor in the world, and uh, as the commissioner said, you know if we can coordinate effectively we can be really really effective and, and that is a challenge to us i think in a more complicated world and the theme of today's discussion is around effective multilateralism how can we make multilateralism more effective and when we heard sandra and the commissioner talk about the eu itself as a multilateral organization um and that's true and i think and i think there is is, you know, if you look at all of the positions that member states occupy in multilateral organizations, I think it's clear we can do better collectively than we are doing. Uh, and today's discussion, I think, is a reminder to us in Ireland uh, that we need to think about how we coordinate more effectively and better to maximize the return on our own investment, but also, also to maximize, um, you know, our influence um, and, and our kind of collective safety and and, uh, and and so I think, you know, just like Team Europe is, I think, at, at, at a beginning, I think this conversation is going to be one we're going to have to return to. And I think today was a really, really useful introduction to a theme that we'll have to take forward again. So with that, David, I'll hand it back to you. Thank you very much, Rory. Um, one, one final comment from my own side uh, is that I think in, in your earlier remarks, Rory, you referred to the interesting change of title for the commissioner. And uh, I, I, I agree. I think it is quite significant that uh, development is now presented explicitly in terms of partnership. The commissioner herself referred to uh, the fact that partnership is one of the five Ps uh, in, in the 2030 agenda. And... Uh, uh, as I would say, modestly, I, I, I had some role in, in, in drafting those five Ps, but we were consciously trying to provide for partnership as the concept uh, which will underlie implementation of the SDGs, partnership between all countries, but also within uh, individual societies, between government uh, um, the, the private sector, uh, civil society, academia, uh, and indeed international organizations uh, like the European Union. So I'm glad that the 
commissioner's title has altered in that sense, and uh, it, it sends a very important signal. I know that partnership has been a central theme for Irish aid uh, for, for many years. So um, let, let's just say that uh, the commissioner's talk, I think, has brought all of these themes into, into uh, focus for us, and it was very, very um, uh, helpful and interesting to hear that presentation. And Sandra, renewed thanks to you for uh, very ably um, uh, answering a whole range of questions for which you wouldn't have had any advance warning. Thanks a lot. We really benefited from it. We look forward to seeing both you and the uh, Commissioner on, on future occasions. In the meanwhile, the best of luck with your vital work, okay? And on behalf of the IIA, I thank everybody who took part in, in today's event and looking for, look forward to the next events in this Development Matters series. Thank you all.